Let's bring in our panel. Antoine Seawright is a CBSN political contributor and Democratic strategist. Caitlin Huey Burns is a CBSN political reporter. Leslie Sanchez is a CBS News contributor and Republican strategist. And Gabe De Benedetti is a national correspondent for New York Magazine. Welcome to you all. Um, let's start with the president's push for unity. Um, Leslie, let me um, start with you. How do you expect that to actually play in the House chamber tonight, given what we know is this very polarized political landscape? You know, for a while there, there was this issue of, of people trying to match the president in terms of coarsening of our culture and coarsening of the language. You know, we talked about the contemptuous eye rolls and boos. I think this is a chamber where it allows all of that to step aside. It's going to depend a lot on um, the president's tone. And trying to, and, and I, I do think you're going to see this. You, you heard it during the government shutdown. Mm -hmm. He did have kind of these broad strokes of we can find a way to work together. Now behind closed doors and on his on tweets, he was much more aggressive. But I think in, I think he can set that tone. The question is, once it's received a certain way, and then the immediate aftermath of this, I, I think it can unravel any type of goodwill very quickly. You want to weigh in, Gabe? Yeah, the idea that there's going to be goodwill from Democrats after this speech is just wishful thinking. Uh, and it's not on Democrats here. It's basically on, sure, on everyone. But really, the reality is, if President Trump strikes a unifying tone, it's a tone and tone only. I mean, we've seen this before from him, where people around him say, you need to unify the country, we need to talk about bipartisanship, and then nothing actually happens here. This is the most divisive president we perhaps have ever had, and to pretend otherwise, because of one speech is just, it's ahistorical. So it's interesting because, Caitlin, the New York Times reports President Trump has been, quote, complaining that his address is, quote, too gentle on Democrats. So, I mean, do Republicans <laughs> want the president to be tough on the Democrats? Well, they want to, well, they want him to make his, his theory of the case and talk about things that they want to talk about, mm -hmm. which is, is the economy uh, is, is a big issue, right? Again, we're, we're starting the process of another presidential campaign. So Republicans want something to run on. They want the president to have things to run on. They want to be allies of the president. So they don't want him to kind of play the, the route that he's been going on Twitter. Uh, but there is, to, to Gabe's point, there's such little incentive for political incentive for Democrats to do anything that would help this president, again, because of the political reality that we're in. So I just want to think about that picture, Antoine, of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, up there on the dais uh, as President Trump delivers his address. I mean, after tonight, what are we going to be seeing from Democrats here as the president tries to push forward any kind of agenda? So a couple of things about tonight. The president will visit Nancy Pelosi's house. Mm -hmm. um, she is now the speaker. The pressure will be um, huge for the president for many reasons. Number one, they, he will have to set, strike a tone and immediately have to follow up because there will be a crisis facing him in days to come. Um, the unique thing about this opportunity tonight, it, it gives the president a chance to return to his comfort zone, the campaign trail. I viewed every one of his addresses to the nation as the campaign trail for him. It's familiar. He throws out what I call his right wing red meat rhetoric to his base, gets them jacked up, and then he goes back to being Donald Trump. And that's who he is. That's how he got to where he is. And I don't think you're going to get any change in that regard. The other thing is historic because this is a divided Congress. And the one thing we know is this will be real political pressure on our democracy, and I think. And I don't think this president has proven to do well in times of crisis, i.e. the government shutdown that extended. I just think that the pressure will be too enormous for this president tonight. And what happens tonight really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, is what happens when he leaves. His tone in the negotiating room will be the key. Um, you know, Leslie, the last State of the Union, he talked about tax reform. He talked about, of course, Supreme Court uh, nominees. Um, this year, it would seem the border wall, obviously, is, and right. immigration is going to be a central focus. But you still believe there is a chance, albeit a slight chance, that perhaps comprehensive immigration reform is is there for the president to hint at? Or it's so, what? It's a smart I just, move. And it's so funny. You, you seems see just see Republicans. You, feel, you see all the Republicans are cringing right now, thanks yeah. to you, when you put those words together yeah. of comprehensive immigration reform. I see a pathway where the president can have his border enforcement, his, his border security um, apparatus, whatever that may be, all the technology and infrastructure he wants to put to that. And the trade-off of that is to have legalization for a certain pop set of the population, mm -hmm. the DACA students, some of the temporary, uh, that there is an opportunity there. It's not for the 11 plus undocumented 
individuals here, but yeah. it's really for a, a sliver that, that Republicans have talked about for a long time um, and, and they have battled internally. And you can look at other presidential elections. The money dries up on the Republican side when you talk about those things together. But this is an opportunity to, to, to bridge that gap. And the president ha does, in this case, I believe, have the political capital to do it. And he's leveraging that. This is a card he's playing. Um, and, and that's why he's ratcheting up the argument of border security. Well, what do you think, though? Because, I mean, we've already seen the president succumb to pressure from the right. Well, uh, and so, well, I mean, for the <laughs> political capital here, how much does he have? Well, I mean, he has all the capital in the world if he mm -hmm. wants to just say, you know, forget about the wall. Let's talk about border security mm -hmm. and technology and all these other things and then, you know, strike a deal with Democrats. But mm -hmm. Democrats are not going to, I mean, not planning on that at all. And mm -hmm. there's no way in the world that the president's base would abide that kind of thing. So he could have played this card at any point in the last, I don't know, two years years mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is of course we're going to talk about immigration because he perceives this as the one issue that he can always go back to and rest on and, and use to really as we've been talking about use as this red meat for his own base and for his own supporters but again what we're likely to see in the coming weeks is some sort of deal sure because of course the president knows that it's not good for him to continue to shut down the government like mm -hmm. this especially when it's the, the blame is so squarely on him but the question really is is he going to uh, scale back in any significant way from this wall ask it doesn't look like it what it looks like is going to happen is he's going to try and declare victory one way or another the real question of course is what that looks like on the ground at the border are we going to see a lot of new wall mm -hmm. uh, probably not well, okay, but, well I was just say, that's the that's where they're narrowing the argument is that if that if you are not for border enforcement and secure securing the border in any poor a point of entry then you're for open borders full amnesty, you know, for everybody, everybody to get citizenship, and you already heard the president echoing some of those words. So that, those are the words I'm listening for, because that's yeah. really where he's laying this The argument. problem yeah. is, we heard my leader, Mr. Clyburn, I was just texting with him um, mm -hmm. a few seconds ago, he laid out the vision of what Democrats expect post tonight, mm -hmm. that there's areas of the border that needs to be fixed. The Democrats are for border security. They will continue to be on the record about that, but they're not for his concrete wall. Mr. Clyburn said that I think A barrier? I think you Steel will slats? I think you will consistently hear tonight from Democrats in the Congress, um, particularly say they're not for that, but they are for border security, they're for fixing fencing, they're for improvements, all the things, and they're actually for coming to the table with Republicans. This was said quite a few times tonight to get a deal on comprehensive immigration reform. But here's the other thing that tonight will face for Donald Trump. He will face a united Democratic Congress in the House and the Senate, and that's something he's not had before, and truthfully, that's something President Obama didn't even enjoy at times. And actually, with signs of some fracture within the Republican coalition. Remember, mm -hmm. just last week, That's Republicans right. sent a big message to Donald Trump on his foreign policy, his wish to withdraw troops from um, Syria and Afghanistan. Right. That was sending a big message to him, and they also did the same on uh, support for Yemen in the last uh, in the last year. So there are some, you know, there's, there's just a little bit of frame. While they want to be with him and they're united around him, his approval among Republicans is still very, very high and at a comfortable level. You're starting to see a little bit of fracturing here, which could also be, you know, critical as we're talking about the Mueller report hanging over this entire administration and what Congress would do uh, with any information. And 2020 election, 2020 Absolutely. Senate, yeah. the 2020 Senate maps looked really good for Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I think that political pressure caused, uh, was part of the reason why we now have an open government and not a closed government, and why we're actually hit, sitting here talking about the State of the Union. I mean, do you think, though, that come February 15th, how realistic is the possibility, Gabe, that we're going to actually see another partial government? Shut down. Oh, it's pretty possible that we'll see a partial shutdown mm -hmm. for a little bit of time at least. It's unlikely that we're going to see another month. But, you know, it's silly for us to predict at this point because yeah. who knows? Right. But the reality is we've gotten <laughs> into this pattern in the last four or five years where we have a shutdown every few months or at least we get very close to it. Obviously, it didn't happen so much under President Obama as it's happening now. What is most likely to happen based on recent-ish history is we'll have some sort of stopgap measure as we continue to have. And they're going to continue another talking about immigration. Yeah. And then we're going to be back at this table in six months saying, is the government about to shut down yeah. again? And the answer will again be, I don't know. All right. Groundhog Day. Antoine, Caitlin, Leslie, and Gabe, <laughs> thank you.